right, good evening, everyone. And I wanna welcome everyone to the BLM California Fire Hire Informational Webinar. Uh, my name is Eric Solomon, and I have the honor of emceeing and hosting uh, our informational webinar for this evening. And I uh, really do appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us tonight. And I'm very excited to have you folks here. We do understand that your time is valuable and we're looking to make the most of this event and to get you guys uh, all the information that you need to be successful uh, in your uh, seeking of jobs here with, with BLM and FIRE. Um, like I said, my name's Eric Solomon. I'm currently a uh, fire prevention mitigation specialist here in Apple Valley, California. And our reasoning for this meeting tonight is really because we have vacant positions and we're looking to fill those with great folks just like you. And we're looking to give you folks all the information that you need to be successful and to share with you all the different uh, roles that are available and all the different types of modules and support functions that we have that you are going to be able to apply to. So we're looking to help you folks get from application to your first day of work. So we have a whole bunch of great folks that are here, subject matter experts, fire chiefs. Uh, we have fire program specialists. We have uh, supervisors from individual modules that are going to be sharing their thought on what makes a great wildland firefighter. And you'll have an opportunity to ask uh, questions um, about anything that you're, you're looking for information on as you go through the, this process. So another thing to keep folks aware of, um, we do have two in-person recruitment and hiring events that we have scheduled. The first one's gonna be in Riverside and that's December 1st, 2nd and 3rd. And the second one is in Sacramento on February 2nd, 3rd and 4th. And what makes the Sacramento, uh, hiring event special is there'll be folks on hand that can help with background checks and medical clearances as well. We may actually be able to make some of those uh, job offers in person um, during that particular program. So um, the other thing that we're looking for tonight is to share the information about the BLM California Wildland Fire Program and really what we do and what we offer and the, the ways that folks can get involved in some of the jobs that we have that are available. So um, we're gonna give you guys in-depth inf information about the types of positions that we intend to fill. You'll hear from those managers, leaders, and supervisors um, for each module location. We'll break those down into different parts of California, uh, give you some information on, on those roles and locations as well. And then we really want this to be interactive tonight. So um, in the chat function, um, you are absolutely encouraged to take the time to type in your questions and we're gonna do our best to get to every single question. And we're gonna make sure that the right people can answer those questions for you. So if you have anything you're interested in at all, any kind of concerns, any kind of things that you're interested in, take a moment, put that in the chat. We'll get those out to the right people and we'll talk about it um, tonight. So um, really, really excited to have you folks here. Um, we're slated for about an hour and a half tonight and we'll take as much time as we need to make sure that everybody uh, gets everything that they need. So tonight we'll cover the overview of the California Fire Program. We'll go over each of our districts and due to locations and types of modules. And then really excited about that Q&A with folks and, and hope that folks take uh, advantage of that and uh, you know take the opportunity to, to ask those questions and, and to interact with these folks. So the <clears throat> what we're, we're gonna hear tonight is kind of a career path and how a lot of the different folks that are on the panel here came to be in the positions that they're in. And what you'll hear tonight is there's a wealth of knowledge. There's a lot of years of experience. Um, and so like for myself, you know, just to get folks interested uh, in some of the opportunities that we have here with BLM, I'm going into my 22nd fire season and uh, way back early in 2000, in the early 2000s, uh, really I was looking for a seasonal job to get myself uh, through school. Ended up working a couple of seasons as a, as a temporary and I absolutely fell in love with it. And I became a full-time permanent firefighter and have been as such to this day. And I still absolutely love it. So one of the cool things that I get to do is I get to uh, teach people about preventing fires in the first place. Um, I also have the duty of uh, actually investigating those fires, finding out how they start, and then getting to create different types of campaigns to try to uh, limit or minimize our unwanted fire starts. So, and then the other cool thing that I get to do is I get to uh, start to create this really cool medical program, uh, Fireline uh, Operational Medical Support Program. So any of you folks that have any type of a medical background, EMT, first responder, um, this is a great time to join our organization as well, because we're starting to really pick up um, 
on some of our, our medical capabilities. And if that's something that you're interested in, we can definitely use those skills here. So, so we'll get tonight started. And uh, the first person that I want to introduce is actually our California State Fire Management Officer, uh, Peter Kelly. And Peter is going to give us an overview of the fire program in California. Hey, Eric, uh, thank you for the introduction and I'm happy to be here. Uh, as Eric mentioned, I'm Peter Kelly. I'm the State Fire Management Officer for BLM California. I'm really happy everybody's here and uh, looking forward to hearing your questions later this evening. Just uh, just some overview of BLM. Um, throughout the country, BLM manages roughly 245 million acres. Uh, and like all federal, state, local government agencies, we're responsible for fire suppression on those lands. And nationally, uh, BLM has 276 fire engines, 13 hotshot crews, six veterans crews, four wildland fire modules, 12 water tenders, 23 dozers, 154 smoke jumpers, 34 seats, 26 tactical aircraft, 25 helicopters, and even two fire boats. The bottom line is we have a lot of equipment for fire suppression and firefighting throughout the country. This equipment is not only used for fire suppression on our lands, but it's also used to help out our cooperators. Uh, it's often used to help out large fires when we're requested throughout the country, particularly the Western United States. The equipment isn't just used for fire suppression. It's also used for fuels reduction, fuels management. And as you can imagine, by reducing fuels, we can either uh, reduce or slow the intensity of wildfires. BLM California manages roughly 16 million acres and is broken into three districts, Northern California or NorCal, SenCal, and SoCal. Each program is unique, has different fuels, topography, and challenges in those areas. Throughout BLM California, we have roughly 30 engines, two hotshot crews, a veterans crew, two helicopters, as well as water tenders, fuels modules, dispatchers, and prevention personnel. All of these positions are equally important, and that's why we're here today to talk about uh, those positions and try to recruit talented folks for these positions. Personally, I got my start in wildland fire in 1997 after serving three years in the 10th Mountain Division, uh, U.S. Army Infantry. While I was going to college, um, I applied for a forestry technician and was put on a Type 6 engine and really fell in love with um, the camaraderie that came along with it, something that appealed to me for my time serving in the Army. I stuck with it and it became uh, my career and I've been doing it ever since. And I'm very thankful for the opportunities that I've had. These are unprecedented times in wildland fire and there's never been a better time to start a career in this field. There are changes that have been made recently to our profession, which allows firefighters to come into an entry level position and have a defined career path all the way up to upper level leadership. A few years ago, this defined career path didn't exist. And now there's an incredible number of vacancies in all of our positions throughout the state and country, which people could apply for. These are all great positions and offer a tremendous opportunity for growth. This career has been extremely rewarding for myself and my family. I encourage all of you to look into these positions with the BLM and hope you all apply. Thanks, and I look forward to hearing, hearing your questions. Eric, back to you. Thank you, Peter, appreciate that. So Peter gave us a great overview of the fire program here in California. And now I wanna kind of shrink that down to some of our geographical areas. Um, and I want you to hear from 
the fire management officers um, at, at those uh, areas and, and locations and, and let those folks give you an idea of, uh, of what types of modules they have and, and kind of some of the opportunities that would be available for folks to apply. And the first person I'd like to introduce is the fire management officer for the California Desert District, uh, Mr. Paul Gibbs. Hey, good evening, everyone. I really appreciate uh, you guys taking the time and gals out of your busy schedule to uh, uh, attend this event here. Um, you know, one thing I, I do want to just give a shout out to Eric. You know, I really appreciate his efforts in the uh, medical program. You know, why that's really important for us is because a lot of times we're in, you know, isolated areas. Um, uh, the, you know, an ambulance isn't always nearby. Hospitals aren't always nearby. And so we do have injuries or accidents. It's important where we can go ahead and provide that uh, medical care that's needed to our firefighters uh, by other firefighters. So thank you, Eric, for doing that. Um, you know, just a little bit of my background. Uh, I started in, in 1987. So if you do the math, that's 37 summers ago. And I uh, started on a uh, fuels crew. I had uh, cut firewood with my uh, dad and my older brother growing up. And so um, I ended up uh, running a chainsaw for uh, for my first year most of the time on that fuels crew. Uh, we were basically, uh, you know, back during the, the 80s, a lot of timber harvesting was going on in a lot of areas of the country. And after they'd harvest the timber, we would go in there and cut down the smaller uh, green trees and prep to poop, prescribe burn those uh, areas later on in that fall or the next fall, uh, wanting to get those fuels down on the ground and then turn red, which would be the carrier for the prescribed burn. So uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, similar to Peter, I actually was in college at the time and uh, really wasn't thinking of a career in fire. I actually was uh, looking at forestry, but you know, I started on that fuels crew and, you know, we often say fire is one of those things you either like or you don't and you know really quickly. And I just really fell in love with it. Um, you know, I remember being in the, and even though I was on a fuels crew, we also went out with the engines. I remember being in the back of the engine and going out with the, everybody else to uh, my first large fire in South Dakota. And just being so excited, right, to have that road trip and and travel to another several states away. And uh, this was a really neat time, really enjoyed it, uh, really special. And just like Peter, it's just like, man, this is what I want to do. This is why I want to stick with and. And so I have, and it's been just a great career. Um, you know, I just really encourage you to, if you're interested, I mean, obviously you're interested because you're here tonight. So go ahead and apply, right? Uh, and uh, just encourage you to do that. Um, for my district, you know, we have the map up here. We're down in Southern California. Uh, you see Ridgecrest there, Ridgecrest, high elevation desert area. Uh, we have an engine st that uh, reports out of there. They staff there. They also travel about an hour north to a place called Alancha. And uh, so yeah, they cover those two areas, uh, two areas, sorry. Um, you know, all that travels on the clock and everything. Uh, we have barracks in both locations if that's a need for somebody. So that's available uh, if that's important to you. And, you know, Alancha is more of that Eastern uh, California. You know, you can see the Sierra Nevadas. They've got you know, really pretty view right outside of, of that uh, station there. Um, over in Air Essex, Essex is a kind of our far eastern uh, station there. That's a interagency station we have both between the Bureau of Land Management and the National Park Service. Uh, it actually sits in the Mojave uh, Preserve. And it's actually uh, pretty close. A lot of the folks there um, work in either Mojave Valley or Lake Havasu area over in Arizona. And uh, we do actually have barracks there too. Um, so if you, again, if that's a need, uh, there are barracks available there. Uh, dropping down kind of the central part of our district, you see Apple Valley there on the maps. So Apple Valley is where we have more resources than the other areas. So there are three engines there and a helicopter there. And so uh, again, we have barracks there. So if you're interested in Apple Valley, it's uh, not too far from uh, San Bernardino, um, that kind of area in Southern California. Uh, great place uh, there, high desert, uh, you know, beautiful clean skies uh, most of the time. And then you see San Bernardino there proper itself. San Bernardino is where our dispatch center is. So um, the positions we have available there will be in our dispatch center. Uh, there are no barracks uh, available there. 
um, but there is ample uh, housing opportunities uh, around in the community. Uh, dropping down from there, you see Riverside. Actually, I'm in Riverside at the office here tonight. Uh, that's where I work out of, and we're going to have an engine there uh, this summer. Uh, again, no barracks there, but there is, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities in the community here. Uh, I live about five miles from from the office here. And then, uh, if you kind of head on over there towards Banning, uh, Banning is a an uh, station that we share uh, with the Morongo Indian Reservation. So it's actually on the Morongo Indian Reservation. It's their facilities. And uh, we also have a, an engine there. And uh, there aren't barracks there, but you can travel about 30 minutes to Yucca Valley, which is just north of there on the map. And so we have had people that have done that before who have wanted barracks. They've went ahead and made that commute, sometimes carpool with another crew member. Um, so then I'll go up to Yucca Valley. So Yucca Valley, uh, again, high desert, uh, just uh, and that's another interagency station we have with the Park Service. So we have Villam engine there, Park Service engine there, and that's at Joshua Tree National Park. A lot of people are familiar with uh, that park. It's uh, pretty popular this time of year. Um, so as far as, you know, overall picture, what are we looking at here as far as uh, positions and jobs? So we have about that area that you see, we have about 11 million acres uh, in the BLM that we're responsible for. And then there's about 4 million acres of park service, be it Death Valley, Mojave Preserve, and Joshua Tree National Park, the three parks that we work with in our agency. And so... Um, as far as number of jobs, uh, we've got uh, we've got about a hundred positions um, that uh, total in in our unit. Of those hundred, there's about thirty five of those positions that we're planning to fill. And as Eric mentioned earlier, we have this event coming up in Riverside, and uh, the event itself, where you can come and and meet us and get an interview. Um, will be December 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. We'll be starting at 9 in the morning, ending at 4 in the afternoon. So if you're interested, uh, come out, meet us, meet some of our staff, um, you know, talk to us, uh, you know, if you want to get more information. If you want to apply online, that will open up uh, November 29th and close on December 4th. So if you can't make it in person, you can also apply online. And even if you do come in person, you're still going to need to apply online. Um, you know, if you apply online and you can't make it, we can still set up interviews uh, virtually. We've done that before. So don't let that discourage you. If you can't physically get here, we can still accommodate that. Um, you know, the, the other thing, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we have that dispatch center. So of those 35 positions or so, there's about seven we want to fill in our dispatch center. And the dispatch center uh, there at San Bernardino, it's interagency with the Forest Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the National Park Service. And it's very unique to where um, we don't shut it down. It's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, fully functionally and open during COVID. We didn't shut down. We just limited who have access. You know, we, we have a, a lot of, there's about 30 million acres that that dispatch center covers for dispatching uh, both fire and law enforcement. Um, one of the unique features about that dispatch center is, you know, during the uh, summer and this time of year, um, we're still doing fires. Uh, I got two engines on fires today. One's in San Bernardino uh, County helping uh, the county fire department there. And another one's over above Palm Springs on some BLM land, a fire we have there today. And so because we can get fires, any day, any month of the year, and we do get them, you know, January, February, March, we're still getting fires down here. So that's dispatch is always operating. The other thing is down here is, you know, it gets hot out in the deserts during the summer, so we don't see as much visitation. But this time of year, and really it kicks off on Halloween weekend, maybe you've heard of Glamis or Dumont Dunes, big OHB areas, a lot of people like to travel there. And so our law enforcement and recreation really ramps up. And so uh, since we dispatch both for law enforcement, recreation and fire, always a busy dispatch center, always a need. And those seven positions, those are permanent full-time positions, year-round positions, um, you can uh, get in at a lower level and promote all the way up to uh, what we call the GS7 position. And uh, I think folks will maybe share a little bit more about what that might lane later, or you can ask some questions on that. 
Um, as far as the other positions go, we have about eight to 10 uh, career seasonal positions we'll be filling across the district. Most of those are on the engine and one on our helicopter. And then we have about, a, about 20 uh, temporary positions we're going to be filling uh, split about equally between the engine uh, and the helicopter. So 18 to 20, somewhere around there. So that kind of gives you a, a feel of uh, the positions we have. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of desert areas. You know, we do probably have two to three million acres that's uh, sand. There's really not a, veg a lot of vegetation. Don't get a lot of fires in that. You know, the other nine million acres or eight million acres or so, um, you know, a combination of desert habitat and some chaparral Southern California brush. I mean, right now uh, we've got an increase and in our cooperators increased uh, number of engines on right now because we have red flag warning Santa Ana events. And um, so uh, unique for us here uh, compared to a lot of the places in the, the country where um, pretty much uh, could have year round activity and we prepare and plan for that. So that's really uh, what I wanted to share tonight. I, again, appreciate everybody jumping online, joining us for this. Hopefully, if you have questions, you can get those in the chat or, uh, uh, you know, we can answer them. And uh, so now I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Dave Brentsfield. He is the fire chief uh, to the north, uh, Central California District. And um, let's go ahead and turn it over to you, Dave. Thank you, Paul. As Paul stated earlier, my name is uh, David Brinsfield, and I am the Central California District Fire Management Officer located in Bakersfield, California. Um, real quick, I'm going to stick to the script. My uh, my staff put together this this, this little write up, and so I, I definitely want to pay homage to them and, and read this, and then I'm going to go off script, and then I'll I'll get to the map. So for some of you that are not too sure of my title, and so I am a fire chief, 6100 of my fire program. The Central California District Fire and Aviation Program strives to be a diverse professional organization dedicated to leadership and the oversight for all wildland fire operations and related activities throughout the district. In my program, uh, we take pride in the wildland management efforts to undertake a broad range of activities to safely protect the public, the natural landscape, wildlife habitat, and recreational areas. The Central California District spans from the Sierra Nevadas to the Pacific Ocean, approximately 2.7 million acres of public land within this district. Once more, my staff and I will provide the leadership and oversight for you in all of the following activities, the fire suppression, preparedness, predictive services, fields management, fire planning, community assistance, and protection. And most importantly, it also is the fire prevention and education and of safety. All right, now I'll kind of go to the script with the, the map on you, you see before you. So again, I'd like to take this opportunity to give everybody a chance. And so this is where it, it comes in. So I was given an opportunity in 1994 uh, after working several years for Mountain Home Conservation Camp 10. And then like my whole entire life has been in this district. And so we'll start there within Placerville. So in Placerville, we have, um, it's a veterans crew. It's Folsom Lake veterans crew. And so uh, without the barracks at this time, but we actually have housing, some housing for it for some folks now. So I'm very happy about that. But then the Topaz and the uh, Lee Vining, which is mono, uh, we do have a, a light, a heavy uh, with barracks. Very excited about that. Then the Bishop will actually have a light engine with, uh, with barrack opportunity. And then Porterville is the dispatch center. And Bishop, we have two dispatch centers. So in Bishop, it's OBICC. And then Porterville, it's uh, CICC, so we have two dispatch centers. The Onyx, Bakersfield, and Taft, those are the Bakersfield program that we have in the Valley Bottom. The Onyx station has the barracks. The Bakersfield station is where we have the Kern Valley Hotshots and the Metro station with, uh, without barracks, but we have the town of Bakersfield. And then the Taft is the Taft, Taft, the city of Taft, we like to call it the gateway to the Creasel National Monument, but uh, also a station with, with no barracks. And then at the uh, in Taft, we have two light engines and a water tender. In Bakersfield, we have a light and a heavy engine. And then in Onyx, we have two heavy engines and a water tender. Again, I'd just like to say, like I've been in this this district my whole entire career. It's been a, it's a really good district. We take the opportunity with the leadership, the training, and everything that's put forth. And just like the rest of the districts, I mean, we're just looking for for folks that want to work. 
I think it's just like we're all here to sell you something and tell you something. But I think in all, we just we just want folks. So my speech is this: basically, it's just to encourage all of you to to apply, um, apply throughout California, and apply for for whatever district you want. There, we uh, we're here, we're available. We want to teach you, and um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much what I want to say. Thank you for everything that you guys done. I'm logging on again, like Paul stated, if you have anything, put it in the chat. And at this time, I'd like to pass it on to Rob Wingler, the ADFMO for uh, the nod. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, like uh, like David said, my name is Rob Winkler. I'm the Assistant Fire Management Officer for the Northern California Bureau of Land Management. Um, I sit in Redding, California there, uh, center of your map. Um, and so our district is focused on the, the northern northern part of the state. Um, so we have, uh, we cover four different field offices, uh, one in Arcata, California, one in Redding, California, um, a field office in Alturas, and a field office in Susanville. Um, Susanville uh, has a couple duty locations, and um, I'll go through some of the resources that are staffed out of Susanville. Um, so we have an interagency dispatch center there in Susanville shared with the U.S. Forest Service and uh, CAL FIRE, uh, you know, with, with the Bureau of Land Management. Um, we have uh, two fire engines out of uh, Susanville, California duty location. Uh, they staff out at uh, Ravendale. It's a little bit to the east there. Uh, and then we have a uh, helicopter also out of Ravendale. Um, duty located uh, in Susanville. And then we have uh, an additional two engines down in Doyle, California, uh, a little bit to the south there. Um, also out of Susanville is uh, the Diamond Mountain Interagency Hotshot Crew. Uh, so Diamond Mountain works for uh, the district office, um, and that's uh, where I started my federal career. Um, doing seven years with uh, with Diamond Mountain, and um, you know, really uh, lear learning the ropes. Uh, you know, some foundational years uh, were built there at Diamond Mountain, and um, you know that continues to be a, a, a premier program um, throughout this state and the and the and the nation. Um, and so, moving north uh, to Alturas, uh, that's our Applegate field office. Uh, we have uh, two engines out of the Alturas field office uh, duty location. They work out of West Valley. And then we have two, uh, two engines out of Cedarville. Um, and then we also host a uh, prescribed fire and fuels module out of Alturas as well. Uh, and so uh, we, Northern California is unique in that aspect. We do have uh, three of these prescribed fire and fuels modules uh, out of Northern California. So the one I just mentioned here in Alturas, um, we have an additional in Redding and a third in Arcata, California. Um, and so those are uh, eight to 10 person modules who their focus is on uh, prescribed fire and fuels projects, um, mostly hazard fuels reduction, um, but the programs like Alturas that works through the summer um, they could be asked to configure into a suppression module and assist us with any initial attack uh, within that field office. Um, I'm going to move to the west and talk about uh, the program there in Redding, California. Um, so that's primarily a, a hazard fuels program. We do host a eight to ten person uh, fuels module. Uh, that program is a little bit different in that we uh, staff that module. Uh, during the winter months. So we're just having seasonals come on now um, in November and they'll work through, uh, it depends, but March or April. And so their focus will be prescribed burning. Uh, it will be uh, mechanical and manual fuels reduction. Uh, they'll assist with some uh, contract coordination as well as uh, assisting with uh, any agreements that we have with uh, our interagency or um, uh, state partners. Uh, also in the Reading Field Office, um, we have a prevention program and uh, some additional uh, uh, you know, fire management officer and, and other, uh, other fuels managers. Uh, moving west to Arcata, uh, we 
have a single engine. It's a light engine type six uh, out of King Range Nas National Conservation Area. Um, and that engine uh, staffed with two individuals um, and they, they work a traditional summer season um, and they uh, assist there on the North Coast. Um, where we are beginning to uh, staff out a prescribed fire and fuels module there in the Arcata field office and uh, mimicking the tour of duty um, that Redding utilizes. And so uh, bringing people on in the October, November timeframe, and then um, folks would in their core season, uh, March and April. Uh, so they would work the winter prescribed or um, focus mainly on prescribed burning and hazard fuels. Um, some additional uh, aspects to the Northern California program and, and really through the state, um, you know, we, we also host uh, fire prevention and education officers uh, across four of our field offices. Um, those folks, uh, and, and Eric had talked about it a little bit, um, it's a pretty, pretty exciting field as well. Those folks are tasked with, uh, you know, doing some fire investigation at times, um, educating the public as how to prevent fires, uh, going to uh, many public events that could be outreach, just like this one that uh, you know Eric is has uh, has uh, done his part to uh, to MC for us, um, and so those those uh, those jobs can be really rewarding, especially for folks that are um, interested in interfacing with the public primarily. Um, I think that's everything I had to uh, highlight here in Northern California. Um, I will end um, with an echo from the other uh, two fire chiefs uh, across the state. Um, and I, I really just encourage anybody who is interested and, um, you know, is interested in a career in fire, whether it be uh, just some time in between semesters or something you are looking for, um, you know, a, a full career or just something temporary. Uh, it really is a, a really rewarding job. Um, it will, uh, at a minimum, teach uh, you know very hard, uh, very hard work and good work ethic. Uh, but it is super rewarding, um, and so if you at all feel like it could be a position you might be interested in, I would encourage you to apply. It doesn't hurt to apply. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Eric. I think there's a few questions in the uh, Q&A and in the chat, um, and I think he'll, uh, he'll answer or hand those out. Thank you. All right, thank you, gentlemen. I, I really appreciated that. I, I really love um, hearing when folks talk about their programs and and uh, and kind of sell their areas. You can tell that there's a lot of passion um, behind that, and to have our fire chiefs here tonight to share that directly with folks, I I just love that, and I'm really glad to be a part of something like that. So um, I hope uh, I hope folks enjoyed that, and uh, remember those those folks are still here for the the Q and A, and uh, uh, around to offer their. Uh, their thoughts and and uh and, and what makes a good wildland firefighter so just keep that in mind as we continue through the evening um so we got a couple of questions um <clears throat> the first one's a great question uh and so one of the things about federal wildland firefighting that i know in doing hiring for many many years of my career is uh one of the questions that i get is is do you have government housing and some agencies, yes, some locations, yes, and some places, no. So it, it kind of just depends. But the question was, what are the what are the barracks like? So we call them barracks. That's just kind of a term that we use. Or we could also say the word dorm. Um, you know, we, we it's it's kind of uh, up for interpretation, but they're all different at each location. And, I, and I'll kind of talk on, uh, you know, what what I know of, you know, here at Apple Valley, we have a lot of. Uh, we have a lot of equipment here. So we have a helicopter and we have several engines and a water tender. And, um, you know, we host a lot of resources here during the summer, um, you know, when we need extra, extra suppression power, um, you know, so we have a lot of folks here, but the, the barracks here at Apple Valley are great. Um, they're, uh, they're modular homes. And if you're a person that's uh, in need of government housing, uh, you know, that's something that's available. So, um, you know, you get a private room here in a, in a modular home with a shared living area. Um, I know that at 
the Black Rock Fire Center out in, uh, you know, Joshua Tree has beautiful individual rooms with a shared living area at a great station. Um, you know, sometimes they're just like little dorm rooms like you would see at a municipal fire station, um, you know, like a, like a small room that's private and, you know, with a shared living area. So what that does is it really, really helps folks because the housing, um, you know, out here, especially in Southern California can be really difficult and challenging for folks. And, you know, to, to be a seasonal worker who may not be able to, uh, you know, sign a year lease or a year and a half or two year lease plus rents are really high. The government housing um, is great. So I'm, I'm really proud of the BLM. I, I know a lot of places offer government housing and that's a huge selling point for us. So um, it gives folks the ability to have a great place to live while they're working their season and, and working on their modules. So um, that's definitely a question to ask um, a, a potential supervisor or someone if you're looking at applying to a particular location, just kind of asking those questions um, you know, to see if that's a good fit for you and see if those things are uh, available. So, um, and then we got a second question about BLM honoring tenure, and I'm going to turn that question over to our human resources expert, Ashley Tabotep. Hi. Um, yeah. So if you think, if your, your question is, if DOI honors tenure, so if you're a tenured employee, yes, all federal agencies should honor the tenure um, that you have earned. Um, so that is a short and sweet answer. Thanks. All right. Ashley, do you want to grab do the uh, age cutoff question as well for folks that are applying? And maybe the resume question as well. Those are in your wheelhouse, I think. Sorry, I did not see those other two questions. There was an additional question about um, pay two, and I can I can cover that later on. Um, good afternoon. What qualifications are are we looking for on a resume? Well, um, it really just depends on the position that you're applying for, um, and so I would definitely we'll get into a little bit of what um, a vacancy announcement looks like or a recruitment announcement looks like, or. I think we'll show you a little bit of that, but um, really I would just say re read that announcement and it'll tell you what you need to, to qualify for positions moving forward um, should you apply. Uh, is there an age cutoff? There is an age cutoff and that is also in the vacancy announcements. It's specified. Um, there, there could be a reason for you to um, not you know, to not meet that specific age cutoff, you know, maybe if you were in the military or whatnot, um, held a position. So there are kind of a few different, different factors that can play into that. So um, I can give you a more detailed answer. I'll, I'll just drop that in the chat so um, you can read that. It's pretty, yeah, 37 for permanence, but yep. When you talk to HR, we have a lot of different answers. Sorry. Um, Eric, I will drop it back over to you unless you want me to answer the rest of these that kind of touch HR. Sure, if you don't mind, we'll we'll grab those. Um, will the permanent full-time positions be available for threes, fours, fives, or is it solely for the um, GS5 or GS, the higher GS levels. Uh, it really just depends on what the organization needs. So um, some organizations have decided that they want to have some permanent lower graded positions. Um, and when we talk permanent full time, just remember we have permanent career seasonals as well. Um, and so permanent, whatever it is, career seasonal or full time, we are hiring for the, all of those um, work schedules. Um, at our hiring events. Does the tenured applicant get priority over other applicants? I will answer that and just say no. Uh, a tenured applicant is just a tenured applicant. That just means that um, you necessarily won't have priority over anybody. So um, bring your A game, set yourself apart from the group, however you decide to do that. Um, thanks, Kurt, for bringing up the 37 for perm and where can you find that announcement? Um, I think Eric is gonna answer that question in a little bit and talking about where he can find, um, where you can find some of those announcements and what is the age cutoff to help part-time. Um, regardless if you're full-time or part-time, that is, um, 
37 is the age cutoff. Calls always matter, um, Antoine. So like I said, just bring your A game when you calls matter, interviews matter. It all, it all adds up. So everybody just, um, you know, if you go in an interview, just sell yourself. You, you're there for a reason. You want a job. We want to give you a job and make it easy for us. So I am going to turn it back over to Eric before we get too much in the weeds with the questions. And then we'll, we'll circle back and answer whatever questions you start putting in the chat again um, at a later time. Thanks guys. Sorry. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. I, I love having our experts here to answer these questions. Like I said, we're going to do our absolute best to make sure that any questions you have that we'll answer those to the best of our ability. And uh, we definitely, uh, We'll be transparent in our answers, and uh, if any of us don't know the answer, we'll definitely find it for you. So um, we're happy to happy to get folks uh, headed in the right direction when it comes to hiring for these positions. So feel free to continue those. And so the next thing that I want to do uh, in the chat, there is a resource for the BLM Fire Hire website, and I, I just want to take like two minutes just to show folks. Uh, what that website looks like and some of the information that uh, is in it. So hang on just a second. Let me screen share this real quick. So in the chat, uh, we have this uh, fire hire website here. There's a couple of things that I want to show you. So um, for wildland fire hiring events, um, like we talked about, um, we have the Southern California one, which is going to be in Riverside on November 20 or uh, which is gonna be uh, December 1st through the uh, 3rd. And so the Southern California applications um, for USA Jobs, which is the website that we use for everyone who is uh, trying to, to gain uh, federal employment, we go through USA Jobs. And I wanna briefly touch on that here in just a second, but to let you guys know, um, for the SoCal jobs, those periods that we'll be accepting applications on the USA Jobs website is going to be November 29th through December 4th. And then the other locations that we talked about um, this evening will be uh, January 29th through February 4th to coincide with the uh, on, on in-person hiring events that we're having in Riverside and Sacramento. So uh, as Chief Gibbs um, spoke about, you still need to apply online, um, even though you're going to come and, and see folks in person and, and do interviews and, and shake hands and meet folks face to face. But the USA Jobs portal is fairly user-friendly and it can actually help you tremendously um, in your job search and also is a great way for you to capture all of your experiences, all of your quals, um, to upload certificates if you have them or past training. And so I urge everybody to go to USA Jobs and to click on this. If you don't already have a profile, sign up, put your profile in, and create a really good resume, a really good detailed resume using the resume builder. I still in 22 years of being, or since we've used USA Jobs, I still use the resume builder in there because I like the way that it flows. This gives you time. So November 29th to December 4th for the SoCal Jobs, and then January 29th to February 4th for the other ones, gives you time to get into USA Jobs and it gives you a chance to really build your profile so that when you do apply for these jobs, when we are accepting applications, that everything you have, like Ashley said, set you apart and that you are giving us the best application that you possibly can. And it gives you time to meet with our folks, to reach out, to ask those questions, what you can put in a resume, uh, what you can put into a complete application to help you know uh, set you apart from, from other folks. So that's what we're looking for. So when you go into USA Jobs, I just want to quickly show you, this is what you're going to see. So the California jobs are not listed in here quite yet. And that's because I, I told you guys the dates that those will be open. But I just want to show you an example. So if you were looking to be on a hell attack crew for a wildland firefighter, and you came in here and you did that search and you found this and you clicked on this, what you're going to get is this big giant apply button right here. And so when you build your resume and you put all your certs in and all your stuff, um, you know, applying to a job is, is actually relatively painless. So take that time to build that profile, get a good resume in there. And this is what you'll see. Um, they'll give you a summary about the job. 
They'll show you who the job is open to. Over here, you're going to see the open and closing dates, the salaries, the pay scales, the vacancy locations that you can apply to, and then what duties you can be expected to uh, reasonably perform. And it gives you a lot of detailed information in here on, on what exactly we're looking for with each of these modules. So um, these requirements will be down here, conditions of employment, announcement numbers, control numbers, um, you know, every, everything that you need to, to know, pretty much any question that you could ask about those jobs is gonna be contained within here with the uh, USA Jobs um, uh, application process, you know, how you'll be evaluated, required documents. So those are really, really, really important. And I really want folks to take time to look at that and read through this entire thing and make sure that you have all of the things that you need for a complete application. And if you don't, now is the time to look at these kind of jobs and, and give yourself time to get those things. So I just want to show you guys that. So when you have time, check, check that out. Um, it's a great resource. Um, and it, it'll answer all of your questions. So the back on this website, just real quick, we do have our outreach for Riverside and our outreach for Sacramento. So that information is on there. And then there's a couple videos here that kind of show what wildland firefighters do. They're pretty cool um, that we've done. Uh, we've, we filmed some, some pretty good social media spots um, to showcase the work that we do. And then for this right here is really important. So remember this, you click on wildland firefighters, and what I want everybody to take a moment to see is down here, it can show, it'll show you information by state. And then each one of these is a blurb on each individual function that we have, you know, hand crews, fuels crews, veteran crews, shot crews, prevention, you know, engines, investigation, support duties, dispatch, all that kind of stuff. So when you click on that, it'll go pretty in depth and we will find, uh, you'll find that there's quite a bit of information on there and you'll learn a, a lot about the jobs that we have available. So it may help you um, in your search to find a good fit for you. So um, that website is, is in the chat. So you're free to click on that and to just explore that when you have some time. And let's see. So we're going to take just a moment here to catch up a little bit on the questions that we have for the chat. And so Daniel asked, will the applicants who go to the Riverside hiring event take priority over those who go to Sacramento hiring event or those who apply online uh, due to it being sooner? Or will we have the same opportunity no matter which hiring event we go to or apply online? Okay, so the easy uh, answer to your question, Daniel, uh, no worries on that. So the in-person hiring events are not mandatory and anybody who's applying to any of our fire jobs are gonna have to apply online anyway. So the hiring events are an opportunity for folks to come out and to meet the frontline supervisors and the firefighters that they'll be working with um, to ask those questions, to do interviews, um, put a face to the name, drop off a resume, um, learn more about the position and actually talk to the folks that, um, that you'll actually be working with who can tell you everything that you need to know about that particular location or that particular position. So no one is going to get precedence over anyone. Um, the only thing that's cool about the Sacramento one is they were able to get with the medical folks there and the background folks there. So there are a couple of things that could be checked off, but no one will get priority over anyone else. It's just some of the, uh, some of the things that are mandatory for us to do, like the medical and, and, and background checks for federal employment are just something that may be done faster, but no one will get a job over anybody else. So uh, that answers your question. All right. So the next thing that we're going to do, um, we don't seem to have any extra questions quite yet. So what I wanted to do um, was I wanted to give, um, we'll call them subject matter experts, but, uh, you know, our, our folks that manage these um, programs, manage these modules and manage these locations that, that folks are going to be applying to, um, I want to open this up to a red robin. And I want folks to take a moment to kind of talk about their crews. We thought it would be beneficial for applicants to hear from the supervisors and from the folks managing these programs, what they feel is makes a good applicant for a particular type of a module or what, what a person can really expect to, to do when they're given an, a job offer and they, they actually start working on these suppression modules. So. Um, I'm going to start this with uh, the crew section and Mr. Dan Dobbins is going to lead us off and we're going to just kind of pass this around as a red robin and, and talk about each particular uh, 
you know, module that that we're going to be filling positions for and just give these folks a, a second to just explain those positions and what those folks are looking for and what can make someone successful in that position. All right, thanks, Eric. Uh, good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. My name's Dan Dobbins. I'm the superintendent for the Diamond Mountain Hotshots here in Susanville, California. Uh, let's see here. A uh, quick summary on me. I've been in fire for 20 years, uh, 17 years on a hotshot crew. Um, and the last five years, the superintendent of Diamond Mountain Hotshots. So you have uh, a couple other crews joining Diamond Mountain here in California. You got the Kern Valley Hotshots out of Bakersfield, California. And you've got the Folsom Lake Veterans crew out of Placerville. So uh kern valley uh, like i said out of bakersfield which is in southern california and then you got Folsom lake which is uh in placerville just outside of sacramento so central california and then diamond mountain up here in northern california out of susanville so i uh, figured i'd give a brief introduction on kind of who crews are uh combining the interagency hot shots and the full and the uh, veterans crews so crews what do we do right generally uh all three crews generally do uh, very similar work. Uh, we suppress fire. Uh, we do this by primarily moving unburned fuel uh, from in front of the fire, uh, using chainsaws, cutting trees or large woody debris, uh, and then coming through with hand tools, scraping down to bare mineral soil. Um, and then, of course, at times when strategies and tactics dictate, we may even conduct some backfiring operations, uh, you know, the, the classic using fire to fight fire. So big thing here is uh, it's a hard job. So the, the big deal is it's uh, very labor intensive and requires our crew members uh, to be fit and mentally prepared. Uh, they need to be prepared to be pushed towards their personal limits. I, I'd say personally, I believe fitness is key. Uh, starting now, uh, if you haven't started now getting fit, like your fitness in order and, and prepared for the season that's coming, uh, you, you should be thinking about that. Uh, and reaching out to crews and modules and all resource types and seeing if they have any advice for you. So um, it's also going to help you set up for success on day one. Uh, if you take the time to be fit and show up, it's going to help you out on day one. So uh, again, uh, as I introduced earlier, the, the crews in California, uh, two of those are interagency hotshot crews, also known as, a, as an IHC. Uh, I'll be using that acronym a little bit, IHC. So that stands for Interagency Hotshots. Uh, you have Kern Valley and Diamond Mountain Hotshots. And we're also lucky to host the, the, the one of the first veteran crews in the nation, uh, Folsom Lake Veterans Crew. Uh, and while these crews do conduct very similar work as each other, there are some differences. Uh, these differences are found in the qualifications and standards, uh, primarily that are needed to be considered an IHC or an Interagency Hotshot Crew. So as an IHC, we're bound to qualification standards set by the National Inter Interagency Fire Center. Uh, these, these standards ensure an IHC is able to conduct operations in very remote and isolated areas uh, in complex terrain with very little support, uh, as, well, as well as take on some of the more complex fire assignments. Uh, generally, an IHC is looking for someone with prior fire experience, uh, maybe a year, maybe two, uh, you know, we'll see where that goes. Um, so prior fire experience due to the complexities of the assignments an IHC takes. So I want to be clear here and don't let it fool you. Uh, veterans crews are very capable resources and often have uh, the same type of people on them and are more than capable of taking on tough assignments and also taking on these same critical assignments. Uh, just maybe at a lower frequency and, and someone maybe even argue that as well. And, uh, and I'm sure they'd have a very valid argument on that. So some other things to expect with the crew. In general, whether it's an IHC or a veteran crew, uh, we travel a lot. Uh, that's one of the best parts of the jobs, in my opinion, as we travel nationally. Uh, all, all three crews are considered a national resource, and they're allowed to move around the country and go to where the large fire assignments are. So if that's what you're looking for, it's a good fit. If you like being on the road, it's a good fit. Um, and, Sometimes, you know, numbers are hard to come by on how long you'll be gone, uh, but I, I'd, I'd go ahead and say, you know, plan on 80 days or more, uh, two week assignments coming home for some days off, and then hopefully hitting the road again, doing it, getting out and, and going where help is needed. So uh, some other things that we're looking for, as far as what an individual may have or need, 
Um, it's going to be dependent on the position that we're that we're looking to fill. Uh, but let's go ahead and focus on an entry level an entry level firefighter. Uh, it's going to be helpful to get your basic fire classes done. Uh, S-130, S-190, L-180, NIM 700, and ICS-100. Uh, you can find these classes on NWCG uh, and their website and take them online. Uh, you can also reach out to modules. They can kind of help you out and get you directed in that on you know, where those classes are. Uh, there's also fire academies and, and other things here. And anyways, uh, some other things that you might want to look for going to be uh, an EMT. That's going to help sell sell you on a resume. Uh, getting an EMT course, it's always nice. Makes a, a supervisor feel good when they've got EMTs showing up. Any sort of volunteer work that you've done, uh, specifically into fire and EMS, uh, that's helpful. Uh, but any other volunteer work will, will help separate you from the pack as well. Uh, but really what we're looking for is the employee that wants to be here. Uh, the, the one that wants to learn and to be pushed. Uh, that I can't I can't say that enough. It, it's, it's a challenge, and you really want to you really got to want to take on that challenge. And, and when you do, it's a it's a great job. Uh, I'm a little biased. Uh, I've been doing it for a while. Uh, I still I still do believe it's the best job in the world. So uh, that's my introduction on crews. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free drop them in the chat. I'm sure uh, one of the panelists can get to it, and we'll see if uh, if I can answer it for you. Uh, thank you. And next we'll go to engines. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm not sure why my video is not working either. Um, gotcha. Anyways, uh, my, my name is uh, Rob Headland. I'm an engine captain here in the, the Central District, uh, BLM. I've been a engine captain here since uh, 2000. I'm gonna let you guys do the math on that. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, all my time has been on engines. Uh, I've had opportunities to to go on the crew to kind of fill in with with the hotshots Kern Valley, um, but you know I was always drawn to the engines. Uh, it's just something about the the initial attack. Uh, getting getting called on the radio to respond to a fire, uh, driving down the highway, you know, in the engine, passing up all the traffic and, you know, pulling up on scene and assessing the situation, putting a plan in place and attacking the fire. Uh, so that's kind of like, uh, you know, that's that's been my cup of tea ever since I started. I never had a desire to leave, um, you know, although you know, kind of get in my older years, I kind of, I look back and I wish I had at least done a, a year or two with the crews, but, you know, I didn't. So, you know, here I am. Um, the, the engine world is, is vastly different from the, you know, the hotshot crews that, that Dan was talking about uh, a little bit uh, different tactics. Uh, however, same mission are the, the mission is to put the fire out um, and, and to do it safely. Um, but with it, the engine modules, uh, their goal is basically, you know, getting water to the fire. And we do that in numerous uh, ways. Uh, we do a mobile attack where we're driving the fire truck along the fire's edge, spraying water, putting it out. Uh, when the terrain gets a little too tough to where we can't drive our engines, we then switch up to a progressive hose leg, uh, which is then where we're putting hose on the ground all the way up to the top of the mountain and spraying water as we go. Um, also the engines can be, you know, support and burning operations. So as the hotshot crews are burning, the engine crews are kind of right there, um, holding heat along the line and then also assessing the green and make sure we don't have any spot fires. So, um, different tactics, but, you know, same mission and we're constantly working side by side with, with the hotshots. Um, so kind of the, the breakdown of what we have in California with as far as engines, um, our district FMO is kind of over, went over with, with the equipment we have. So, um, but the main two pieces of equipment that we have that we utilize uh, are gonna be type three engines and type six engines. Uh, the, the type three engines are gonna be a, a five seater uh, truck. It's the bigger trucks uh, that for, 
off-roading. It's it's not the big red, big long red trucks that you see in the city, but they're made for off-roading uh, and maneuverability. They carry at least 500 gallons of water uh, and five personnel. Uh, you can get a lot of work done. And then we also use Type Six engines, which is basically an F350 uh, with a pump package, and those things are uh, utilized very well for for mobile attacks as well. Uh, the breakdown and how those the engines, the staffing goes. We've got an engine captain, an engine operator, an assistant engine operator, and two firefighters on the Type Three engine. Uh, the Type Six engines that we have, we usually staff those with an engine captain and a firefighter one at the minimum. Um, but we have staffed up to four personnel on a Type Six, and you know, even nowadays, out of uh, folks out of state. Uh, they'll even staff their Type Six engines uh, with six people, you know, following with a with a chase rig. Um, so, kind of the, the things that I want to talk about with with how you can be successful uh, as as a crewman on a, you know, not just a an engine, but you know, it's this is, you know, fire service in general. Like, you know, you if you have these calls you know, these qualities about you, you're going to, you should be able to succeed in this business. Uh, Dan talked, touched on earlier about physical fitness. Um, yeah, the hot shots, they do a lot of crazy stuff, you know, humping around mountains and everything. Um, the engines, it, not as much hiking, but what we do, you know, I, I kind of, I've always told people that, you know, hot shots will use their energy throughout a 16 hour period. The engine folks, at least on a Type 3, when you're putting in that hose late, we're using our energy within the first hour trying to put out all those, those hose packs. Um, for those of you who don't know what a hose pack is, it's basically a, a bag of hose, and it weighs about 45 pounds. Um, and you're carrying that up the hill along with the, your regular um, fire gear that you already have on. So you're going up the hill with about 80, 85 pounds right off the bat, and you're walking down the hill grabbing more packs, going back up. So that can destroy someone's energy extremely quick. So uh, physical fitness is extremely important in this business. Um, another one of the, those things that I kind of see that, you know, people that I tend to be drawn to are people that are self-motivated. Uh, someone that, that can recognize when something needs to be done and can get it done. Uh, if, if you're the type of person that, you know, needs to be told what to do um, rather than seeking something. Um, it, it may not work out for you. Uh, adaptability is another big one. Um, things change. If, if you're set on a schedule, like everything has to happen this way in order at this time, it, this, this job ain't going to work because this job is nothing but it's a plan destroyer. As soon as you make a plan, something comes up to destroy that plan. So you need to be able to adapt. You need to be able to be able to change from going this way to that way. Just today, you know, you heard from Dave Brentsfield. He threw a, a zinger at me today and it's like, hey, we're not doing this anymore. We're doing that. And so last minute, I'm trying to get everybody together and plan for next week because it's all changed. So this type of stuff happens on the daily and you got to be able to adjust and uh, deal accordingly. <laughs> this is probably my best one is uh, somebody who wants to work. Um, we get people here that just want to get, make money, which, you know, that's, that's fine. But those type of people don't last. We want people here that, that want to be here that want to work because this job is work. You know, you, you can't, you go to a fire, you're not going to, you're going to have to work. It's, it's hard work. It's fun. It's rewarding. Um, yep. Um, positive attitude. The Dan mentioned earlier, you know, being gone, you know, 80 days, you know, 14 days at a time, two days off and then going back out, you got to have a positive attitude, you know, especially during, you know, day 13 on an assignment when everyone's getting under each other's skin, yeah, you've got to be able to, you know, suck it up, be positive, find something to be positive about, even though you're going to the same piece of ground, working on the same, you know, dirt that's been cold for four or five days. 
Uh, you got to find the positive and be positive because as soon as you start being a Debbie Downer, you you bring down everybody. Uh, so positive people, love them. Um, I think that's really about all I got. Um, yeah, um, I'm here. If you guys got any questions, um, I can pawn them off to somebody. <laughs> that's all I got, Eric. Uh, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, promised you all uh, passion and we're definitely delivering that tonight. So uh, appreciate you guys very much. Next, we're going to skip over to uh, dispatch. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Tierra Honey, a logistics dispatcher up in the Northern California dis uh, district at Seasonal Interagency Fire Center in Susanville. Um, there's also the San Bernardino and Porterville Dispatch Centers, um, in which we all may work a little bit different. We're located in different areas across the state. Um, we also work with different agencies within those interagency dispatch centers. Um, I've been in dispatch for two years now, and I didn't have any fire background prior. It's not a requirement within the entry level positions. Um, you have a lot of room to grow and progress in the dispatch centers within BLM. Um, some of the things that we are looking for and also make a good dispatcher is a person having good computer computer skills, clear and concise communication, being able to multitask and take initiative in fast paced environments, which is a lot of the times very fast paced. Um, in dispatch, every day is different. It's not black and white. Um, you have fire season, winter season and the in between. Um, our busiest day is during fire season. We can be handling multiple situations at one time from medicals to fires and law enforcement assist. Um, we help assist each other with radio communication and as well as keeping CAD, which is the computer aided dispatch system updated and keeping track of all of our fire resources, and our personnel, along with ordering additional resources needed for the incidents. So that can include engines, crews, water tenders, water and different supplies to help the fire line personnel. Um, you have to maintain a lot of different programs and keeping all the stats up to date. It's a huge thing. You know, how many fires and human caused lightning, stuff like that. Um, during slower days in the winter season, we are monitoring the radio during prescribed burn season. So we help with the assisting the fields personnel and keeping track of acres burned for them as well as catching up on tasks that were postponed due to the fire season, which happens. And uh, we also assist other agencies. So within CIFC, we have CAL FIRE, the Park Service, and the US Forest Service. So we all work together as a team in here and same with the other dispatch centers. Um, I am biased also, like a lot of you guys have said, being a dispatcher has been a very rewarding job. Um, and I continue to learn new things every day, so. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. And I will put in a plug for dispatch. Um, I've been uh, covering and helping out in dispatch for many, many years in my career. And I can tell you that I've walked away from a couple of dispatch shifts way, way, way more exhausted than a day fighting fire. So um, that's uh, if you like fast pace and excitement and multitasking, that might be something for folks to look into. So uh, the next uh, module that we're going to cover is helicopters with Dean Hall. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah, my name's uh, Dean Hall. I'm the uh, superintendent here at the helicopter at Apple Valley. And uh, yeah, I've got, you know, I got my start in uh, 92 on engines. I got into aviation around 96 and I've been there ever since. Uh, worked for the Forest Service for a while and uh, started, got my start at BLM here and then uh, I've come back. So made the full circle. So, but uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, a day in the life of a helicopter crew member. Um, you know, for us, we start our day, uh, do roll call, check status, or see if you're flying or driving. Get stuff ready, do physical training, you know, running, hiking, um, stuff like that. Do our daily briefing, go over weather, safety topics, what plans for the day. After that, do some project work, waiting for fires to start. You know, if nothing happens in the afternoon, we'll do some training, the classroom stuff for practical exercises. And then, at the end of the day, clean up and do it all over again. We get a fire call. You know, we're gonna get on the get on board the ship, 
you know, depending on whether or not you're flying, if you're driving, you're going to get the vehicles ready for chasing them. You know, we can fly to a fire. Uh, once you get there, you know, we'll go into initial attack mode. Uh, so we'll find a place to land uh, close to the fire so we can get out and go hike to the fire, dig some line, you know, cut some brush, stuff like that. You know, and then if uh, need be, we'll switch into a logistical mode where we'll, uh, you know, if we need to cut a hell spot or we need to fly in some uh, uh, personnel, additional personnel into the fire, uh, supply them with cargo, that type of stuff. And of course, the water we're going to water drop, and we're going to hook up the helicopter's uh, bucket and whatnot, and they're going to go do their thing. And we'll be coordinating with them. Uh, you know, if we're working with them, uh, we'll be coordinating with them on where to drop water uh, and all that good stuff. Um, you know, the, the Helltack is a pretty dynamic job. You know, it's a, does it can change at the drop of a hat. You know, we'd be sitting around waiting for a fire to go to 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 get the fire call. Then we're up and running. Uh, going 100 mile an hour, and then we could switch gears, like I said, and go into logistics and stuff like that. So for us, uh, you know, in Helltech, what we look for uh, when we're getting uh, getting crew members, we're looking for folks. For, everyone's pretty much touched on everything as far as what we really look for. So physical fitness, like I said, uh, it's a key because we can go from zero to 60 in a, in a couple seconds, right? So physical fitness has to be there. Hiking up hills, we don't always land at the top <laughs> and uh, have an easy go at it. Uh, so it's uh, uh, quite a big hiking can, can be involved, carrying a lot of uh, gear around. So it's uh, it, it's definitely uh, a priority. Uh, the other priorities for us, you know, is attention to detail. You know, folks that uh, because safety is uh, you know number one, right? We've got a lot of things going on out there. You got fire going. Got a lot of moving metal in the air. You got stuff you're spinning <laughs> around at the uh, high RPM that you don't want to run into. So attention detail is very important. Uh, adaptability, as was mentioned, is very important. Uh, fitness is very important. Um, you know, we need folks that are, you know, able to learn, willing to learn, and willing to work. So uh, because, like I said, things can change, and uh, you have to be uh, adapted and improvise to that stuff. So, but, uh, you know, like folks said, it's a, a rewarding job. Uh, it can be very rewarding. Um, you know, we can be, you know, we can travel all throughout the United States uh, and the territories, uh, as can everyone, uh, for the most part, this, in this wildland firefighter job. We go mostly in the Western states, um, but, you know, have been to Alaska, have been back east, uh, all that good stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, and we can be gone for weeks at a time. And, uh, you know, usually the standard is a 14 day <clears throat> assignment could be a 28 day assignment. Um, you know, and then you, then you come home, have a couple of days off and are back at it. So we need people who will be committed and, uh, um, and just be able to work and want to work. Um, so anyway, I think that's about all I got for aviation. So back to you, Eric. Thank you, Dean. I appreciate that very much. Um, we're going to move on <clears throat> to, uh, to kind of continue this Q&A. And I, I want to thank um, my panel very, very much for you guys um, taking time to talk about your modules. I, I think that's super beneficial for folks to hear from you directly what, what makes you successful on that module. So um, thank you. Thank you for that. So there is a question that was asked earlier that um, I, I think is very important and it affects everybody. And it's definitely something that's being talked about. So um, our state Fire Management Officer uh, Peter is going to um, talk very briefly on this question. So the question is um, that there's many available positions, but that due to the pay issue regarding the federal government, um, regarding wages for federal firefighters um, and kind of where we're at with that, um, you know, uh, uh, Peter definitely is involved in that. Um, it's a hot topic for everybody. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Peter, to kind of touch on where we're at with that and what kind of progress we've made. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Yep, um, not an easy question to answer, but I'll, I'll do my best. Here, here's where we sit. In the president's proposed budget, there is a new salary table for wildland firefighters. Uh, GS3 employees would get an increase of 36% and 
as you go up in the pay scale, uh, it would the percentage would decrease by three percent. So, for example, if you were a GS three, you get thirty six percent. GS four, thirty three percent. GS five, thirty percent. All the way till you get to a a GS fifteen, and I think you'd be at roughly one and a half percent. So that's the proposed pay table. The second piece of that in the president's proposed budget is how we get paid on wildfires. Currently, when you go out on a wildfire, uh, you get paid your base salary, uh, you get paid for your overtime, and if you're on the fire line, you get paid a premium pay, something that's called hazard duty pay. What you don't get paid for is the time away from home or the time uh, that you're sleeping, even though you are committed to an incident. In the president's proposed budget, you will get paid for that. So you'll get paid for 24 hours a day as you're on an assignment, you will be getting some sort of payment. Um, and then the, the third piece of the president's proposed budget was a uh, an elimination of a salary cap. So um, if, if someone were to, um, to go out on a lot of wildfires and make a lot of money, um, there is a limit to what a GS employee could make, and I, I think it's roughly $180,000, and essentially that's that's taken away. So uh, you get paid for exactly what you've earned. The issue is, as I'm sure everyone is aware, that this legislation needs to be passed by Congress. Congress didn't pass a budget, and we're currently in a continuing resolution. However, it has bipartisan, this legislation has bipartisan support. So the Democrats and the Republicans both agree uh, with the president and want to see this pushed through. So we're hopeful and optimistic that once the pay, once the, once Congress passes the budget, this legislation will go through and we'll have the new pay table uh, the new change and how we get paid when we're on a, a wildfire and assignment, and also the um, the elimination of the salary cap. But there is one other piece to this I just want to mention, and that is currently all wildland firefighters who make up who make greater than forty thousand dollars get a retention bonus of twenty thousand dollars a year, and that's broken up per pay period. If you make less than $40,000 a year, that retention bonus is uh, reduced proportionally um, to a certain level. And I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but that's what we currently have. So I think Daniel Lopez, I, I answered your question, but I just wanna say people recognize wildland firefighters, what we're doing, the, the, um, the importance to our country, uh, to our, our lands, BLM lands, our federal lands, and um, it's finally being recognized. And I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic um, in wildland fire now. And I think, uh, I hope I answered your question, and if not, please um, add anything else and I'll, I'll get to it. Thank you very much, Peter. I appreciate that. Yeah, there's uh, we've been fighting for this for a long time. And, and I could say, um, you know, as a GS employee that I'm really proud of uh, the retention that we have and the fight that that we have right now and the support that we have as well. So I, I really am super optimistic at some sort of a long term resolution. So um, for folks that are, are thinking about that, um, you know, just know that we've been doing this for many, many years. And this this year um, and last year, we've made more had more successful strides in that fight than we've had in the 22 years that I've been a wildland firefighter and I've never felt more optimistic. So in all honesty, I'm, I'm pretty happy about where we're at and it looks like we have some good support and we're, uh, we're making some headway. So great question, Daniel, appreciate that. Definitely a hot topic, something that we talk about within our ranks as well and stuff that's getting out, um, you know, more mainstream, uh, as something that we're fighting. So, um, and then one of the, the last um, folks that I, I wanted to bring up um, is our fuels and our prevention folks. I want them to kind of talk about their program uh, because fuels have become a real big deal within wildland fire management as well um, and prescribed fire and fire prevention. Well, 
Laura, right. uh, appreciate that, Eric. Uh, again, my name is Rob Winkler. I'm the Assistant Fire Management Officer for Northern California BLM. Um, and I, I just wanted to get a chance, you know, we've talked a lot about our suppression resources this evening. Um, and that's, you know, primarily what folks think about when we talk about the fire program. But um, right now is also a really exciting time to get involved in the hazard fuels um, and the prevention program in these fire and uh, in, in uh, fire programs altogether. Um, the fuels, uh, the fuel shop, um, you know, we're really focused on uh, reducing fuels before a fire occurs, but also sometimes after a large fire occurs. Um, we do a lot of work right in the wildland urban interface. So um, where Bureau of Land Management lands might come up against um, private or public infrastructure or along roadways. Um, and so we we put a lot of time and effort into reducing fuels along those, those type of corridors. Um, we also do projects uh, to benefit uh, multiple resources. So it could be um, timber objectives, could be wildlife objectives, could be waterways or fisheries objectives, um, any number of things. Um, and a lot of it is uh, manual and mechanical thinning. So a lot of work with chainsaws, uh, making piles, uh, could be uh, coordinating the work and directing the work of a, say, a machine like a masticator that's built to grind or stack brush. Um, or we may be uh, laying out and prepping for prescribed fire operations, so broadcast burning, where uh, with the correct conditions, um, you know, we will have suppression lines pre built, laid out, and then uh, a group of us will go out and um, we'll fire a unit. Um, similar to suppression firing, but um, just really trying to target uh, favorable weather conditions to limit mortality and to achieve uh, positive objectives um, by using fire. And so um, I'm from Northern California, but um, those, those things I outlined, that work is done through all three districts. All three districts have really robust hazard fuels programs. Um, and opportunities for folks to come on as a seasonal and and just see if something like that is is what they want to do or somebody maybe with a little more experience to get on as a career seasonal or a permanent full time. And so uh, Northern California, we do host um, the prescribed fire and fuels modules. Um, and those are a great way for someone at an entry level uh, to get in and, and decide if something like that is good for them. And so uh, a person would learn and do similar work to a uh, hand crew. Uh, there'd be a lot of chainsaw work. Um, there's a lot of tree felling, uh, but we really do focus on prepping for prescribed burning and then implementing prescribed burns. So uh, you could expect to uh, learn how to fire a unit with a group of people um, all running drip torches and uh, working across topography to um, you know, conduct a prescribed burn. Um, an awful lot of hand pile burning is done um, where similarly we'll spread across the unit and ignite hand piles and um, reduce fuels that were made this summer. Um, I just wanted to put the plug in for the hazard fuel shop. It is a really exciting time. Um, and if you are also uh, following where uh, the money is going, you, you know, hazard fuels, whether it's um, after these very large fire events, um, the hazard fuel shop uh, is getting quite a bit of funding and um, it can it can be pretty exciting to plan, implement and see the benefits of uh, working through a project. So um, if there's any hazard fuels questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Um, so thanks. Uh, I'll flip it back to you, Eric. All right, thank you very much. So we uh, we actually did what we said we were going to do tonight, and we actually filled in all of our time. So we uh, we made it the the full hour and a half, which I think is great because I have been in this business for a very long time, and I still get excited when I hear people pitch their programs, and I hear people um, you know excited and proud of what they do. So that's really what we're here for. Um, wildland firefighting is this just incredibly complex, challenging, but unbelievably rewarding career that I still look back and I 
I can't believe that I'm a part of this and have been a part of it for so long. So it means the world to me when folks are interested in joining our profession and, and, and garnering that passion of um, serving the public, protecting the land, the resources, um, you know, rehabbing suppression efforts and everything in between. So I really hope that the folks on this webinar tonight got something out of this. And I really, really hope that uh, we were able to answer some of your questions. And I really, really hope that we were able to elicit some passion and that you really do decide that you want to pursue this because every single person that you've heard from tonight is willing to do whatever they can to support folks and help them along and try to make them the best applicant that they can possibly be. So you heard from some pretty amazing folks tonight that we don't normally have access to, honestly. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an honor to have all these folks in the same room. So I want to thank all of my panelists and I want to thank all the folks that honestly took their time out, you know, an hour and a half on a Thursday night is no, is no small stretch. And we do appreciate your time. And we really do appreciate the fact that, uh, that you guys chose chose to join us this evening and and learn about what we have to offer. So uh, for that, thank you. And then a couple of things in closing, I do want to remind folks um, keep those hiring uh, events in mind, uh, Riverside and Sacramento. Um, and then do you remember that uh, uh, our uh, application period is going to be November 29th to December 4th for SoCal, and the other ones are going to be January 29th to February 4th. They coincide with the um, actual hiring events. And remember the website that we showed you, um, it has a ton of information. I promise you'll learn something and, and it'll do very well. So um, we're going to use the emails that folks signed up with this webinar for, um, and we'll send out some of the um some of this information to you and some of the resources that you have. Um, and then in chat, the BLM California now hiring at blm.gov uh, website is if you have extra questions um, from anything tonight, if you think about something later on, uh, throw us an email, it'll get routed to the right person. And we'll make sure that that question is answered. And uh, like I said, this is now the time for you to grab USA jobs, build the best profile that you can build, reach out, talk to these fire folks. If you can visit stations, visit stations, um, contact these folks, um, ask questions. And like I said, start this journey. Um, you've got a pretty good foundation after tonight. You've learned quite a bit about all the opportunities that are available to you. Um, and I truly wish uh, all of you the best of luck. And uh, I really, I mean this when I say this, hope to see you out on the line soon. So thanks folks. Appreciate your time.